everyone. Undoubtedly, every citizen, every law-abiding and civic-minded citizen of Trinidad and Tobago will know and would accept that one of the grave difficulties facing us in national security and being able to secure our citizens, our law-abiding citizens on a daily basis is the scourge of illegal firearms. Almost every serious crime, and in particular almost every violent crime, and unfortunately the vast majority of murders being committed in Trinidad and Tobago are being done via illegal firearms. For a long time, we've been looking at this, we've been studying it, we as the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago know that every criminal out there wants to have an illegal firearm if he or she does not already have an illegal firearm. Unfortunately, our citizens for the last, I would say, over five years, for, for many years now, have been suffering at the hands of the criminal element who unfortunately have had access to illegal firearms. We all know that firearms are not made in Trinidad and Tobago. I could remember as a much younger person the days where a criminal would use a homemade shotgun or a homemade firearm and how crude those devices were. You also would remember the days where there were not available firearms for use in committing crimes and serious crimes. And you'd find that when the police held the perpetrators, it would be an old rusty revolver, maybe with a couple rounds of ammunition. The reality that we're facing in national security and with our law enforcement agencies who are charged with the responsibility of fighting crime is that, unfortunately, our borders for a period of time were too porous, and there seemed to have been quite a large availability and a large inpouring of illegal firearms. Our law enforcement officers, along with our intelligence agencies, have been working on trying to eradicate and pull back on these illegal firearms. As we've been shutting down our borders over the last few months, and I'd like to thank the men and the women in Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, and the men and women in Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, and uh, in particular the Coast Guard, for the great work they've been doing on our borders, at keeping the borders less porous, making it more difficult for the importation of illegal firearms and arms. The reality is that there are already significant amounts in Trinidad and Tobago. We have asked as an administration for an estimation. I have heard an estimation of illegal firearms in Trinidad and Tobago in the range of thousands. 9,000 was the figure we were told. That is not necessarily an accurate statistic, but it is the best that they can do Our intelligence agencies working with the data that they have, etc. We have the police service, along with the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, taking thousands of firearms and tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition, illegal firearms and illegal rounds of ammunition, off our streets on an annual basis. We, as an administration, have taken a decision, I discussed it with the Honorable Prime Minister, and he gave me the go-ahead. I've asked the Attorney General to do the necessary drafting of legislation, and that's what I've come here today to announce. In my discussions with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and our intelligence agencies over the last few months as to what are some of the initiatives we can take to take the fight directly at the heart of these illegal firearms and take the fight directly at the heart of the criminal element, the small minority of criminal element, few thousand who are associating themselves in gang activity out of a population of 1.3 million. What else can we do? What else can we roll out to take the fight to these criminals and to push them back and to make their lives unbearable and to make their lives more difficult so us, the law-abiding citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, have more room to breathe and we have more room in a safer environment in Trinidad and Tobago. What we are about to launch, an initiative that I intend to take to Parliament in the shortest possible time frame, is as follows. We intend to go to Parliament to make it for when you're held with illegal firearms, no bail. 
to automatically no bail for the period of 120 days. During that 120 day period, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service will work on the prosecution of these individuals who are found with illegal firearms. What we've noticed is, and you would have seen it as well, these little criminals in our society who they call themselves shooters and who think that because they hold an illegal handgun they can terrorize our citizens and terrorize our law-abiding people. We are going to make it difficult for them via legislation as well as combined with the great work that's being done by our intelligence services, our Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and our Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force. There was previously, I believe in 2011, the former administration introduced along with anti-gang legislation, bail amendments that took away a person's right to bail when held with illegal firearms. The UNC opposition then indicated when we, there was a sunset clause on that legislation. When this administration came in and we tried to renew the legislation, the UNC opposition rejected it. You all would remember we then separated the anti-gang legislation from the bail amendments. Again, it was rejected. It was only when you, the population, rightly so, began to put necessary pressure on the parliamentarians that the opposition caved in. They capitulated because you, the population, indicated in the clearest possible terms that you were aware there was a problem with gangs and that our Trinidad and Tobago police service needed to be given the tool of anti-gang legislation to take the fight to these minority persons in our society, criminal elements, and to take the fight to them for gangs. Well, we, the government, are committed. This legislation, anti-bail legislation, when you're caught with illegal firearms, you will not be granted bail. We intend to take that back to the parliament because the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service are asking us for it, and they're right. It is a legitimate cry for there to be no bail for those who intend to live a life of criminality and carry illegal firearms. They should not be provided with bail. There was a high court decision at first instance that declared that formal law, even though it had been passed with a special majority, unconstitutional. The Court of Appeal in the last few weeks has ruled that it is not unconstitutional once passed with a special majority. As a lawyer myself, it is proportional. This type of legislation, there is not a single civic-minded or right-thinking or law-abiding citizen of Trinidad and Tobago who will argue that any criminal held with an illegal firearm should be granted bail or should have the opportunity to apply for bail. No, we will not allow them to terrorize us, the citizens, anymore. We are going to go to Parliament with this legislation and we're going to ask for the opposition support for the legislation because you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, deserve this legislation. You, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, deserve to be safer and to be protected. And the criminal elements' rights to bail should be trampled on and should be taken away for them, from them because they want to live a life of crime and terrorize us citizens. This government is not prepared to tolerate it anymore. We have listened. I've been working very closely with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, with Commissioner Gary Griffith and his executive, and they are the ones who said, Sir, it is time that we rethink and we ask that the government give its commitment and bring this legislation back to the parliament. That is the first piece of legislation that I intend as the Minister of National Security to take to the parliament. And today I'm informing three groups of people. You, the law-abiding, right-thinking, civic-minded citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, as I ask for your support with this legislation to make your lives safer and for us to take the fight against the criminal element and to the criminal element. Let us make their lives difficult. Let them know that if they take up illegal firearms, they will stay in jail and languish in jail with no bail whilst they are being prosecuted. So you are the first persons that I'm asking for support. Secondly, to send a strong signal to the criminal element outside there that we as an administration are not going to tolerate you terrorizing our citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. 
as the Minister of National Security, I will continue to work tirelessly and give my all and put every effort into finding initiatives and into implementing law that would assist our law enforcement agencies in the fight against the criminal element. And thirdly, it is a call for the opposition to be a responsible opposition and to support this legislation that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service are asking for and that I am certain the members of society or citizens of Trinidad and Tobago will ask for all Parliament support in the fight against crime. So that's the first piece of legislation that I intend to take to, to Parliament in the shortest possible time frame. The Attorney General has said he will, will draft it in the shortest possible time frame for it to go to Parliament. That is no bail for persons found with illegal firearms for a period of time and the police will prosecute you during that period of time. The second piece of legislation, which is something I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, is I intend to take to Parliament a restructuring of the sentencing for persons found with illegal firearms. Because very often we're facing a phenomenon of repeat offenders of illegal firearms. So I continue to get on a daily basis at all hours of the day, all hours of the morning reports. For example, there was this week alone, a person shot by the police service. There was another one shot and killed by perpetrators, by criminals with illegal firearms. And you know what you're told? When you see the police report, the person is known for drug offenses and known as a repeat illegal firearm carrier. In other words, they've been charged previously with illegal firearms. When I asked for the statistics and looked at it, there is a phenomenon that has been taking place that these criminals in our society who carry legal firearms, the shooters as they like to call themselves, they're found with an illegal firearm, they're prosecuted in the courts. <clears throat> Unfortunately, at times, the, there's a lot of diversity between the types of sentences given. So I have heard the most ridiculous that persons who are pleaded guilty, they now plead guilty to carrying an illegal firearm, given a fine of $3,000. Pay the $3,000, they back out on the street, walk straight back, pick up an illegal firearm, go and commit a criminal. I intend to take to Parliament a tiered sentencing and penalty system for repeat firearm offenders, illegal firearm offenders. You caught the first time with an illegal firearm, this is the sentence, this is the amount of fine, you're caught for a second time, I want it increased massively. So we take it up another tier. tier. You're caught the third time, strike out. Massive sentence, massive fine. Let us let the criminal element know. Let us tell the judiciary from a policy perspective, this is what we, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, want. This is what we expect. Let the criminal element out there who have terrorized us for too long know when you're caught, no bail, increase in sentences. You want to be a repeat offender, it's going to be a bigger sentence, so you're going to spend longer in prison with a bigger fine. Let us make it difficult for them. It's time for us to take Trinidad and back, Tobago back as we can. The third piece of legislation that I intend to take to Parliament after discussion with the Attorney General is if you are out on bail, because we have a lot of persons who have been charged they get bail, they're out on bail, and you are caught in another criminal act, and a serious criminal act. So you're out on bail, and you want to continue your life of criminality. Again, your bail will be immediately revoked, and also you will be put in prison and have no bail available to you. So if you are out on bail and you decide to continue with a life of criminality, and you are caught, and you are charged, you will no longer have access to bail whilst you await the outcome of that second and first charge. These are three very important initiatives in my humble opinion that I intend to take to Parliament with the full support of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. In fact, it's not only the full support of. In discussions with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, they have asked the same way they asked for anti-gang legislation, they have asked for this type of legislation to assist them in the fight against the criminal element. We all know, as I stand here and I talk, I'm seeing the heads nodding in unison. We all know that there are criminal elements out there in a minority 
who think because they have a piece of metal in their hand that can shoot projectiles, bullets at us, they can terrorize us. Why should they have the normal rights that the rest of us have with respect to access to bail? Why, if they're out on bail, should they be allowed to continue in a life of criminality and terrorize us, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago? As the Minister of National Security, this is one of the initiatives that I am going to go to Parliament with. And I'm putting the country on notice, and I'm putting the opposition on notice, and I'm asking for the full support of every citizen of Trinidad and Tobago who is law-abiding for these three important pieces of legislation, our Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and those who assist them have asked for this type of legislative power, this type of legislative pushback on the criminal element. And I intend to take it to Parliament, and I intend to fight for the rights of every law-abiding citizen of Trinidad and Tobago as we take on the criminal element. No one, and I always say this, no one is above the law. And in particular, those, I was about to say something I shouldn't, those persons out there who want to live a life of crime, we are not going to sit idly by as a government and allow you to do so. We will do all that we can, which includes this type of legislation, to provide the levels of support for the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, other law enforcement agencies in their fight against crime. As I have your attention, I'd also just like to use the opportunity to thank the men and women in Trinidad and Tobago Police Service who are doing a tremendous job, to thank the men and women in our immigration services who are also doing a great job, our prison officers. Our prison officers have up their game, they have the full support, multi-agencies. We are working as multi-agencies, we're seeing the benefits of that. To thank the men and women in Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, men and women in Customs and Excise, because a lot of these illegal firearms, well, not a lot, all of them come in across our borders illegally. Customs and Excise have a role to play in that pushback and that fight. Our fire services, every arm of the Ministry of National Security, the public servants who work in the Ministry of National Security. For us to achieve a safer and more secure Trinidad and Tobago, we all have a role to play. Ladies and gentlemen, this legislation is going to Parliament. I ask that the public of Trinidad and Tobago, through their full support behind it, let us take the fight to those who want to live a life of criminality and in particular who want to use the tool of illegal firearms to terrorize us law-abiding citizens. Let us take the fight to them legislatively as we continue to take the fight to them through our intelligence services, our Trinidad and Tobago Police Force Service and our Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force. I thank you all. I'll take some questions. Just take the mic. Good morning, Minister Rhonda Dowlat, Garden Media. Whilst um, the legislation sounds feasible in terms of, you know, st um, stronger sentencing, revoke, revoke of, of bail, how is this going to work when detection rate seems very poor? One, and would any provision be made for um, law enforcement personnel who allegedly rent their guns to these criminals or even use it for criminal <coughs> acts? Firstly, let me say, as I said on Saturday night in a different forum, statistically the detection rates have improved. But that is for the Commissioner of Police and Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to talk about. We as citizens have actually come to expect in the last few months that when serious crimes are committed, somebody will be held and will be charged. Thankfully, we have been seeing that is becoming more and more the norm. So the detection rate is improving. We continue to meet on a weekly basis. We, I continue to be in contact with all of the heads of national security on an hourly basis, but on a weekly basis and drive. This whole multi-agency is reaping benefits. In the last few weeks, I've been telling them we need to focus not on just picking up the three, four, five illegal firearms. Where do we find these stashes? How do we get to the heart of these illegal firearms being used by the criminals and get them off of them? 
So there are going to be improvements there. That is going to be intelligence driven. The second question, remind me, what was the second question? Apps, okay, good. There is going to also be brought to Parliament another suite of legislation. You heard me talk about it before. The Attorney General spoke about it. it came out of discussions with the Prison Association. Legislation that protects, initially, the prison officers, but also if prison officers are found to be committing illegal acts and engaging in criminality, that we increase the sentences. When we drafted that legislation, the Attorney General and his team proposed, and it was accepted, and has been accepted by Cabinet, to spread that to the fire service, the defense force, and the police service. So we are going to be increasing the fines and the sentences for those in the Trinidad and Tobago police service who are found to be engaged in criminality as well. Any police officer who is found to be engaged in the type of activity you just described, God forbid, renting out his or her service-issued firearm or protecting criminals are not going to be protected. Recently, we had some police officers who were picked up and charged under the anti-gang legislation. Anti-gang legislation captures all types of gang activities. So the support of gangs, if you're protecting gangs, the support of if you're assisting gangs, as a law enforcement officer, you will be charged under that legislation once we detect you and the evidence is there. And the type of the suite of legislation I've just spoken about, I'm hoping will be debated in Parliament very soon. What it does is it also increases the level of fines and sentences for persons who target our law enforcement officers. You target a prison officer, you target a fire officer, a police officer, and we hold you in your targeting against them, you're going to have a different increased level of sentencing. But on the flip side goes the responsibility for those law enforcement officers. Don't breach the law and don't engage in criminality. Minister Young Kyle Saunders from I-95.5. Um, what about persons who are given the guns by the, legal, the firearms by law enforcement officers and they want to come forward and say, so, well, this was given to me by this particular officer. If I, <coughs> I will would they, welcome will there be, that. Will there, will there be any sort of reduced fine, not fines or anything like that, but reduced you know, so Understood. from persons? First of all, in law, the only person who can offer immunity from criminal prosecution in Trinidad and Tobago currently is the Director of Public Prosecutions. So that is solely within the discretion of the Director of Public Prosecutions. I have asked for policy to be developed here at National Security, then I'll take it to Cabinet for immunity-type legislation for exactly those types of in instances where you have persons who want to assist in the fight of crime, against crime, they may be part of the criminal element. And as we say, they want to flip, they want to provide evidence, but they have committed crimes that we have some sort of immunity legislation, which right now is the sole discretion of the DPP. But it also covers undercover police officers and other cover people in, in law enforcement. We would welcome that. I am certain the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service would welcome anyone who knows of any police officers any law enforcement officer who's engaging in a life of criminality to provide that information, once there's sufficient evidence, those persons can be charged and will be charged, meaning the, the, the law enforcement officers who engage in criminal activity. The DPP, whose discretion it is to provide immunity, I'm sure once he is brought into the picture from the word go and guides that type of operation, I'm sure he will act reasonably and responsibly. What's the difference between this and a gun amnesty? A gun am amnesty. Okay, first of all, let me say we are not going down the road of a gun amnesty. I'll explain why. A gun amnesty is when a government takes a decision, bring in your illegal firearms, your illegal guns, your illegal ammunition, and you will not be prosecuted. So just bring it in. It doesn't matter. We'll allow you to leave without charge. Bring it in, give it to us. And very often, the government, government agency, pays a reward in return for it. We looked at it, and in fact, the Commissioner of Police and myself were on a, a radio program a couple of weeks together at the same time. And he looked at it when he was the Minister of National Security. I have looked at it. He's looked at it now in his role as Commissioner of Police. I continue to look at it. Trinidad and Tobago is very different. In places where gun amnesty has worked, it is persons, it, they're not overrun 
by a criminal element utilizing illegal firearms, and they're very difficult to have access to illegal firearms. So it actually takes a lot of illegal firearms off, off the street, reduces the amount of legal firearms that are available in a significant way. Unfortunately, in Trinidad and Tobago, for too long, the borders were porous. There was a particular period in time when the borders were completely porous between 2010 and 2015. We are shutting that down. We're making it more difficult. But because of the accessibility to illegal firearms, and when you look at the type of firearms the criminal element are using now, if you know anything about firearms, there are a lot of semi-automatic pistols being used. There are now a lot of assault-type rifles, AR-15s, AK-47s, the, the handguns they're using, Glocks. Before, it just used to be a simple revolver, as I say, a rusty revolver. So when you look at the type of firearms that are available, we don't think that a gun amnesty is going to have the type of effect in countries where it has been successful. So we're not going down that road. There's also a cost associated with it. Our analysis of the criminal element in Trinidad who are using illegal firearms, they're not going to stop. You see it. You see the impunity within which these criminals are carrying these firearms. So we're not going to reward them for bringing in the old ones, giving them money so they can go and buy the new ones. Melissa Doughty, Newsday, you spoke about the shortest possible time frame. Can you give me an idea as to exactly how long we're, we're looking at? For, for, for what? For the bringing for the of the legislation yes, I've the talked about the today. The Attorney General told me he's already begun the drafting of it. There are a number of steps and stages it has to go through. So after he has completed the draft, we will look at it, review it. It has to go through the Legislative um, Reform Committee, the, the LRC as we call it, which is a subcommittee of Cam Le Legislative Review Committee, sorry. Once they are happy with it, National Security is happy with it, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service are happy with it, it will then go to cabinet for approval to be laid in parliament. I'm going to push for that. Unfortunately, I still have to stick with the shortest possible time frame because you've heard all of those elements, a lot of which are outside of my personal control. But I'm hoping that after the Easter break, not, not too long thereafter, to lay that in parliament and go for it. And you also spoke about getting not only public support but op opposition support as well. How likely or, or certain are you of that? That one is completely out of my control. The opposition support will come once the population cries for that, this type of legislation and, and offers its support for the legislation. That I am certain about. I am certain that the right-thinking, civic-minded, and law-abiding citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, all of them will support this type of legislation. Thereafter, it's up to the opposition, but we will take it to Parliament, and I'm putting the country on notice now. When we take it to Parliament, you have the full support of the 23 members of the government in the House of Representatives and all of the senators of the government in the Senate, because this legislation has not only been asked for by the police service, but I'm sure everyone who's heard it announced here this morning can immediately see the benefits. A criminal will now have to think twice when he or she decides to pick up that illegal firearm to go and commit crime. When you're caught, you no longer can just go and get your bail. Worse yet, if you're caught a second time, what you're going to face. And God willing, not God forbid, if you're caught a third time, as it game over. If you're out on bail and you want to continue with criminality and you're caught, back in, no bail. Every citizen who wants to fight crime and wants a safer Trinidad and Tobago is going to support it. At the end of the day, the opposition members are also citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. That was the reason for this press conference, to get that support, public support. The reason for this press conference, as I said, is threefold. To tell the public you want to know what the government is doing to take on this crime, and this is a crime that affects persons in their daily life. Uh, a PH taxi driver, a taxi driver, I saw, I got a report this morning, plying his or her car. On the way, a gun put to his head, his car taken away. That gun is not a legal firearm. Everyone is affected by this. So it's to tell the population this is what the government is going to do to fight this scourge. Two, to tell the criminals out there and to keep the pressure on the criminal element that we are not sitting idly by under my stewardship. I will not sleep until we begin to make even more significant inroads in the fight against the criminals and stomping on them. And then third, to tell the opposition, listen, we need your support for this. We look forward 
to your support for this. This is not a shouting match between me and the opposition. Be a responsible citizen. Let us give our citizens the protection that they need. With respect to the TIA system, Minister, um, any tentative figures with respect to sentencing, fines? I, I have figures in my head, but I'm not going to broadcast them as yet because ultimately that needs to be decided by cabinet. But I want to significantly increase, increase the figures, I mean, and the fines. And again, I would be surprised if the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago didn't support it. You're caught with an illegal firearm the second time, take a fine of $150,000. A third time, take an even bigger, more substantial fine than that. But as I say, those are policies that will be decided by the cabinet. Minister Yolan Thomas from Nine Seven. Um, you talked about going to Parliament for the first piece of legislation for 120 days. Is it for a first-time offender with an illegal fire? The legislation still to be drafted and still to be looked at and discussed with the LRC and the Ministry of National Security. Why I refer is still to be. Why I refer to the 120 days is that is what existed before. So there was a bail amendment act. I think it came in in 2011, if I remember correctly, by the former UNC administration. And the then opposition, a People's National Movement opposition, supported it because we saw the benefit of that type of legislation in the fight against crime. And what it says, because you can't not allow somebody access to bail indefinitely unless it's murder. Murder is the only offense that you have no right to bail. So everyone has a right to bail. What we're doing is we're taking away a right. So we're taking away a right. To take away a right under the Constitution, you have to provide due process. The due process in this case is your case will be called and prosecuted within 120 days. So it puts pressure on the police, police service as well and the prosecutors. You want this legislation, act responsibly, get the, the, the case heard and determined in that 120 day period. So there's precedent for it, it's not reinventing a wheel. But the UNC as an opposition prevented it from continuing and now we're going to go back to parliament with it. Sonny Gray, um, freelance journalist. What sort of overtures are you all making to the opposition to ensure support for these three pieces of legislation? Since, as, as you said, for the first one, you're taking away your right. And secondly, are we doing enough to support programs that make criminality unattractive, like the citizen security program, funding youth groups, community policing? Are those options on the table and being taken, um, considered seriously by the Ministry of National S of mm -hmm. Security? Sir? Okay. Let me deal with the first one first. Today is the announcement. This is the Three, th three suites of legislation that we're going to take to Parliament. The opposition will hear about it. I am certain the police service and the commissioner will make their plug as to why this is necessary thereafter. And then we'll engage, I will engage the opposition and tell them, look, this is what I intend to do. We would like your support. At the end of the day, I said, I have no control over it. I'm going to say now, we are not going to go to any joint select committee etc. with this type of legislation because it's needed now. This is not new legislation by and large. Let's hear what the police service have to say. Let's hear what the population have to say and we will go for it to Parliament because we need it in the shortest possible time to get it passed and done. With respect to your second question, the answer is you can always do more. Trinidad and Tobago is faced with difficulty in terms of resources, financial resources right now. There are a number of programs that fall under national security. The CCC program, we recently as a parliament took a decision to continue that program and to take more entrance into the program. This, when I leave here, I'm going to chair FNGP this morning. One of the notes I have there is for the MyLAT program. A great program, so I want to get it continued. I want to expand it as well, even with the limited resources. I have seen the young, the young boys, by and large, I've only seen vast majority of males in the MyLAT program pointing. You, you from the MyLAT program? Okay, I don't know why they're pointing at you. I know you're a young intern. Um, and the benefits this is having on their lives. The police youth clubs are something that I support the police fully with. The Defense Force recently also started having some of these types of programs. You talked about the CSP, the Citizens Security Program. It's premature to speak about what I intend to do with it. I have asked, for them, asked them to relook at the program. I think it's time we come with a new program, but utilizing all of the good 
that CSP had, and that's something we're going to call cure violence. They do tremendous work in various communities throughout Trinidad and Tobago. They have my full support, but I want to expand it. I want to. Sometimes you get stale being operating in the same environment, same way all of the time. So I've challenged them. Let's look at what more can be done. In my view, there's only so much national security could do. I'm also looking at reforming the cadet service. I believe by giving young men and women an opportunity at young ages, it helps keep you away from lives of crime. In my interaction with the Trinidad and Tobago prisons, I've also been speaking to the prisoners who are in the prisons. They've made a mistake in life. Okay, let's help them reform. When they come back out, no, they are some of the best advocates to speak to the young men in these communities and the young women in these communities and tell them why, look, a life of crime may not be, is not all that it seems to be and is hyped up to be. These are the consequences. These are the circumstances. Programs like We in Chance has the... And, and, and some of these vision on a mission, what persons like Gart St. Clair and, and, and his wife are doing, these are tremendous programs that national security will give. Over the carnival period, there was a, a carnival production team, some young men. I didn't get the opportunity to meet them, Zebra Peak. Who, what they were doing is giving young children in challenged communities an opportunity to play mass in a controlled environment and to have fun and to have positive outlets. We gave as much support as we could. Those are the types of things I want to continue supporting. We in Trinidad and Tobago all have to do our part. So the answer is I think more can be done. We're doing as much as we can with the limited resources. I think we must always look for the opportunities. I think Nash, um, education, Ministry of Education has a role to play. There needs to be more of uh, all of government, community development, social services, sport, Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs all have a role to play because it is a real phenomenon and is something as a society we are struggling with. Yes, good okay. morning. Andrew Rodriguez, TV6 News. I was wondering what, um, as you mentioned, preventative measures, what rehabilitative measures being put in place so they can reintegrate into society easily? That really falls right now on our prison system. So even with our young offenders who are in YTC, and then the other offenders or inmates in the various prison systems. It is something that I've been putting a lot of emphasis and focus on. I've recently asked the Permanent Secretary's Ministry of National Security for us to look at a proposal from the prison service. For example, it's more along the lines of parole. Persons who may have a sentence for a certain amount of time but are exhibiting remorse, they're exhibiting that they want to be reintegrated. Let's look at how we can get that done because not everyone in prison needs to be in prison for the length of time persons re recognize they've made mistakes also in the prison system what what they had written and the policy that i've asked me look at and i'm in full support of is those types of programs for persons who are in prison helping them reform one of the things the government did recently and i can't speak about it enough is we took a decision two cabinets ago i think to increase the number of psychologists available in the prison system from one to 10, not only for the inmates, but also for the prison officers. That gives persons in that environment an opportunity to speak to professionals, to have that ability. In my view, that's a necessity, that's not a luxury. So as a government, even in difficult circumstances, the cabinet agreed with me and allowed me to increase from one to 10. That's a great move for the prison system. Minister, okay. good morning, Janine Brown, TTT News. You mentioned an estimate of 9,000 illegal firearms in the country at this time. I'm just wondering, I know you said it's an estimate, but I'm just wondering if you could share how that um, figure was, how, how you all arrived at that figure, and also if you are able to provide the number of illegal firearms seized for the year thus far, and perhaps in most recent years, 2017, 2018. Yeah. The second, let me answer the second part first. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service can provide that information, and I'll ask that they will provide that at the next press conference they have. It was very interesting how the young people, very bright young people in our intelligence services, did the presentation on illegal firearms in Trinidad and Tobago. It was very scientific. They looked at the various 
districts throughout Trinidad and Tobago, the various divisions they looked at over a period of years, how many illegal firearms had been picked up in the various div divisions. They used some scientific formulas to project and to expand that as being some sort of sample of what they think exists out there, and that's how they came up with this figure of around 9,000. Uh, Minister Young, Marcel from Newsday. <clears throat> the three strikes you out um, thing, that sounds like baseball, that's American, right? In, in the Caribbean, we play cricket, usually one strike and you're out. I ain't giving them 11 wickets. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm saying what is stopping you, if, if the um, gun crimes are that serious, and they are, right, they've been over 500 in some years, what is stopping you from doing like just two, two strikes? And well, at the end of the day, it's a policy. So the, you have to take a decision with policy. When you look at other jurisdictions, yes, three strike and you're out is an American concept, but it is something that worked in the United States. It's something that worked, for example, when Los Angeles had a rampant gang activity and, and it was going crazy there with gangs. That is something that works. So when you look at other precedents and you look at what has worked, it's normally a, a three-tiered process. So that's what we're looking to adopt. Minister Young, Joshua Simongo from TV6. You said three strikes and you're out. Are, are you suggesting that this is a, a possibly a life sentence? If you're no, I'm not. I, I, that would not be proportionate to, to have a life sentence for having an illegal firearm. And also, could you give, um, I want your thoughts on the killing of the 16-year-old boy, Aki Phillips, on Friday in Laventil. I presumably this would have been at the hands of an illegal firearm. I presume so as well. First of all, I offer sincerest condolences to... His family, from what I've seen, he was a young man with a lot of promise going to St. Anthony's College. And the limited information provided to me, it seems as though he may have witnessed something and recorded it, not 100% sure. And those are exactly the types of persons, meaning the people who targeted and snuffed out this young boy's life at a very premature stage of his development, they're the ones that I personally want to go after. They're the ones that I really want us as a society to bring the full brunt of the law, blunt of the law down upon them. Let us hit them hard, hit them where it hurts, and let them know that we as a society will not tolerate and we do not accept the criminality. Illegal firearms are a scourge. There's no doubt about it. Let's make it very, very difficult for someone who is caught in possession of an illegal firearm and make their life the living hell that they, in turn, have made our law-abiding citizens and ourselves difficult, our lives difficult. Uh, Melissa Doughty again, Newsday. You spoke about the border, um, and you spoke about what's being done to curb um, illegal firearms in Trinidad and Tobago, but what's being done further to stem uh, illegal firearms coming into to Trinidad and Tobago. We saw, um, uh, I don't know if we can remember, the OPVs, etc., uh, uh, to curb those kinds of things. So what else is being done or considered to well, stem illegal firearms coming into Trinidad? It's being done right now. When I say over the past three months, we've been placing a lot of emphasis on securing the borders. As you know, we've ordered two Cape class vessels. That is proceeding full, full steam steam ahead. We expect to take delivery of those vessels next year. It's going to make a, a great impact. Um, I was in Charlotteville last week. We launched two of the refurbished interceptors in Tobago, for Tobago. I used the opportunity to then sail from Charlotteville back to Scarborough using one of our Daemon vessels to see how it performs, to understand what the men and women in the Coast Guard face when they're out on the high seas to offer my support. You've heard me say the same things over and over. Our radar system, we're upgrading our radar system. One of the things I spoke about on Saturday is we recently, at the end of last year, signed an agreement with the United States where we will get access to their radar system in this area as well as satellite imagery in this area and provide them with ours. That, had been, um, that has been done and is being implemented. That assists us as well. There are a number of other operations that are intelligence-driven taking place on our borders right now. So when you're seeing persons being picked up and held on along the shoreline, that is not happening by chance. I can't talk about the exact operations, but it is meeting with success. One of the discussions I've been having in the last couple of weeks with our heads is the philosophy and the theory has to be keep them from even, even reaching the shore. 
So I went on a visit to Cedrus not too long ago, again came up via an interceptor from Cedrus support of Spain through the Gulf because I wanted to see how difficult it is out there in the Gulf and it is difficult. So I will also be going back to Cabinet to ask for some air assets. We had grounded the helicopters. We think we found a value for money alternative, an opportunity to get some, some helicopters and get them back up in the air. So everything that can be done, we're using drone technology. Again, the multi-agency forces are being utilized. I spoke about it on Saturday. Our special forces, our special naval unit, the mops from the police, those specialized units are being utilized to assist Trinidad and Tobago. So every asset that we have that I can use, I am going to use. Minister Jesse Ramley from CNC3 here. And uh, going back to the situation with Akil Philip and your, your announcement of bringing legislation to Parliament, it coincides with calls from one of your colleagues, Mr. Uh, Minister Fitzgerald Hines, for the area to be locked down. Is that something you will be considering? And what are the other interim measures you're going to be implementing until these legislations reach Parliament? Well, I mean, we continue to do the work we're doing as usual, right? I don't want to speak about some of the operations that we're currently planning. I stood here not too long ago, just before Carnival, and, and told you all that there will be intelligence-driven operations going into certain areas and this type of thing. I didn't hear what Minister Hines called for or asked for, but I can tell you at a national security level, we are working closely together with all of our agencies, including the intelligence agencies, in the police service, in the defense force, and the standalone intelligence agencies. And I've asked all of them. I had a meeting with the director of SSA, the chief of defense staff, and the commissioner of police when I'd come back from, from Tobago last week. And it is to say that we have to keep the pressure up and we have to continue with our intelligence-driven operations. We have to go back into the areas where crime is an issue and take back these areas as best as we can. I told you all what happened before Carnival was not cosmetic. It was not going to be a one-off. Let us see what begins to unfold. The anti-gang legislation is being utilized. There have been charges laid under that. They are assisting us with investigations. We are going after the heart of criminality. Last question, after Neil Emma. So very quick update, um, Gaylon Sue. She's being held at the Al Hall um, I came camp. here today to deal with this specific legislation. Fair I think enough, you have been messaging me on this type of, of thing. I will provide you with a response Do specific to those questions. I will provide you with a response. Even in those things, we are very, very cautious. As you know, we've had persons who are outside before, we are very cautious. I had a meeting last week with the Americans to try and get more information on it. That's all I'm going to say at this stage. Thank you. La last, last question. Uh, Minister, can you provide an update with the 14 interceptors that were due to be Well, repaired? I provided that update last week. The first two have been refurbished, and those were the two that were taken to Tobago. I decided let's utilize those in Tobago. The others... There are a number of hulls, the, the, the vessels themselves, that have been refurbished and are repaired, ready, ready to go. But we're waiting on engines. They need new engines. The United States are assisting, at, assisting us with the provision of those engines. And because of their shutdown a couple months ago, it, it delayed things a bit. So as soon as those are gone, um, as soon as those are received, you all will be notified. All right? I'd like to thank you all very much for your time and attention this morning and your participation. Have a great day. Thank you.